Um, so we are in the uh, last two weeks, I think, of uh, this series that we're doing based upon um, a book that, uh, that some of you, some of you know who it is, Tom Short, who's a campus evangelist. And he wrote um, a pamphlet, a, a, a book, that's actually a free download, but um, on the top five questions that he's always asked when he appears at a college campus. So he put that in a, in a book. Um, actually, there's five questions and a bonus six. So next week we'll be doing this, the, sixth, the sixth question that he actually has for everybody else. But, but the topic today is, um, I can decide what is right for me. Or actually the question was, can I just decide what is right for me? That's, that was what a question that people seem to ask him a lot. And I will tell you this, that, and I told it to Joe yesterday, and I think I said it to Joan, I said, I am actually not looking forward to do this message. Uh, I, 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 I was, it, it's, it's a tough message, because the, the, the verse that, uh, that uh, Sarah read is from the book of Judges, and it states that in those days, people did right in their own eyes. And if you're familiar with the book of Judges and what happens to the history of the people of Israel from that point forward, them doing what was right in their own eyes does not turn out well. And so in the bulletin for today, there's, I think, four scripture references. And it kind of gives, I wasn't sure which one I wanted to use or, or to start with, but what it does is it gives you um, uh, bullet points of, of what was expected of the people of Israel and how they ended up living their lives. So I'm going to read Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 through 9. We're going to begin with that because that outlays what God's instructions were for the people. All right, And we'll go through a little bit of, it, of the history of that, but they had been presented with the, the, the Ten Commands been instructed with the, the commands and the, uh, and, the, um, and the rules and regulations that God had laid out for them. And then Moses stands up and says these words. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and on your gates. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so much for allowing us to come before you this morning. We thank you for this beautiful day, another day of life that you've given us. We do thank you for the relationships that we have here. Um, we thank you for the relationships that we, we were able to build over the last few weeks here with our uh, BBS friends and our ESL friends. And we look forward to how you are going to continue to work in those relationships and, and can just can continue to grow the, uh, the the, the people and, and the work and, and again the relationships that, 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 that were started. We thank you again for people like Tom Short, people that are evangelists that go out and, and preach the, the good news to seemingly a, 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 an ever darkening world. And so we pray for those that are, that are on the front line. And we thank you for the people that are behind the lines that are, that are supporting them as well. I thank you for the message this morning. I know that I, 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 I confess that I was somewhat reluctant to because it was scary. Uh, your word is, is cutting. And, and convicting. So we pray for open hearts and open minds to what you have to say. I pray that these words are yours and they are not mine, that, uh, that they will indwell in us and they would encourage us uh, to go out and be the people that you want us to be. 
I pray for boldness. I pray that you just use me as you see fit to, to deliver this message. And as the psalmist tells us, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. So, as a kid, a probably teenager, I uh, had a poster in my room. And the poster said to the effect, um, I do my thing and you do your thing. I don't know, have you ever seen that? You probably might have heard it. Um, it goes on, I am not in this world to live up to your expectations. Okay, I see some nods, okay. Basically what the, um, what the, um, the message for me was, leave me alone. That's pretty much what it was, right? But it, 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 it was probably an outgrowth of the, of the 60s mentality, right? Um, do your own thing, okay? Now we see things like um, Nike sneakers. I don't know if they still have the motto of just do it, okay? If it feels good, do it. You've probably heard that. Um, even, even Burger King. I, I see that, that some, um, some churches have taken on the, the Burger King theology of have it your way. Right? Have it your way. Remember that commercial. So it, it asks, if someone's going to have to do something about, I don't know, if, the, if I have to move or put something in front of it, there's a, a, a light that is shining right through the door that hits me in the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean the, uh, uh, I don't know how you're going to have to do that. But um, the question is, is that can I decide what is right for me? Um, do we have the right to live our lives as we choose? Do we have that right to live as we choose? Or are there limits to how we can act? Are there guardrails, so to speak? We put guardrails up on roads so that people, even if they lose control or, or are driving too fast, they will be prevented from falling off the edge of the cliff or, so, or, or something. Many people today um, would say that um, we have no right to tell someone else how to live. Um, we have no right to tell someone that their behavior is wrong. In fact, people would go on to say that, you know what, you can't legislate morality. Have you heard that? Is that true? I mean, we try to do it all the time. We have laws against murder, all right? We have, we have those, those types of laws, right? We are reminded as Christians, we are reminded that Jesus taught, judge not lest ye be judged. So who are you to judge somebody else? But isn't it true that at least some things are always wrong. Most cultures have, you know, you could go around most cultures, and most cultures will tell you that, you know, that murder is wrong, stealing is wrong. They'll tell you, they'll tell you those things. There seems to be that kind of consistency, right? As Tom Short puts, puts it in his book, he asks this question. As far as absolutes are concerned, are there, is, there, is, is everything absolutely right or everything absolutely wrong? Was Hitler wrong? He uses Hitler as, as an example. Was Hitler wrong? Please say yes, right? Okay. But some people would say, thank you, some people would say that Hitler was being true to himself, even though we don't agree with what he did. Tom does find that in his... Um, in, in his, um, uh, his dealings with college students. They would ask, is Hitler wrong? And they would say, well, you know, he's not really wrong because he was, at least he was being real. And they couldn't get to the point where they would condemn him because they have um, this moral uh, relativism. Someone who is in here that is a recent graduate, I don't know if you might agree with that. Or have, you, have you heard that before? Right? Um, we, we look around, we, we watch the news, okay? 
We see the reports. We, we read things about mass murders and thefts and riots and um, people's lives are, 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 are threatened and bombings and, and, and so forth. We see all the, these things going on. And we see behaviors now that only a few years ago would be completely unthinkable but are now normalized. We see people today who are truly living the motto, do your own thing. They are living their lives in a way that seems right in their own eyes. And a man walks into a school in Texas and murders 19 children and two adults who was doing what was right in his own eyes. Often when we speak of having the right, oftentimes we're really thinking about or talking about free will. You have the free will to do as I choose. We would, we, we, do we have the power to choose in our own lives? The power to choose what to do, what to say, how to live. On the surface, we would say, yes, we do. We have that free will. By free will, we look at the evidence, we look at the data, we look at, at the things that are going on, and we consider how it affects our lives. We think about what do we prefer? What, what, what do I like? Okay? And we weigh the pros and the cons on either side. And then we choose. By free will, what we're saying is that we are not compelled by some external force. Okay. Now, you might say that in some countries, people are compelled to do things at gunpoint. But you know what the reality is, is that they're, they're not. They still have the freedom to choose. And you see that with martyrs that were given the choice of either being burned at the stake or renouncing Christ. They chose freely to be burned at the stake. God gave us free will. He is sovereign. But the things that happen in this world happen based upon His will. And when our free will comes up against God's sovereign will, God's sovereign will will win out. But we're not puppets. And oftentimes when we see things, we have to understand that things happen because God allows it to happen he, or he he allows it to happen he doesn't will it to happen he doesn't force this man to go into Texas school and kill those people but we talked about this some months ago I think but he's sovereign and he could have stopped it but he chooses not to Adam and Eve in the garden had free will they were not compelled how to live. God said, live this way and everything is going to be good and you can walk with me in the cool of the day. They were given choices. And one of the choices in particular that they were given was not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Otherwise, they were free to live in the garden and to eat from any of the other trees and to live amongst the animals and every, everything else that was there. And we know what happened. They weighed their options and then they chose wrongly. And after the fall, when they were kicked out of the garden, God moved to reconcile his disobedient people back to himself. And then as we read through um, redemptive history, as theologians like to call it, we see that God sets a people apart for his own use so that the world would be blessed through them, starting with Abraham. And then the people of Israel, the des those descendants of Abraham, or more precisely the des descendants of Jacob, 
were those people. And God promised the land. And he promised that through them there would be a Messiah who would come and redeem the world. That was what the promise was. Along the way, things happened. Can't go into all the details. But the people were in bondage. They were in slavery. They were in Egypt. And the people were then... Um, they were delivered out of, out of slavery. And they were led by Moses throughout, through the wilderness. And the people, millions that followed and, and saw the miracles, they saw the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, and they saw the parting of the Red Sea. They, they, they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years and their clothing didn't wear out. They didn't run out of food. They didn't run out of water. It was miracle after miracle, and they saw all this. And then they were given the law, the Decalogue, Ten Commandments. And they were instructed, as we read earlier, to remember the laws and the statutes. And then they were told to teach them from generation to generation. And then when Moses died, Joshua was second in command. He leads them across the Jordan River to the promised land. And there in the promised land, they stay witnessed the walls of Jericho coming down. And they had their stumbling. They had their disobedience. But the people lived in the land. They, they conquered it, as it were. Not completely, but that's another story. And then Joshua is coming to the end of his life. And he stands before the people. And he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And, it is, if it is, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, here it comes. Choose this day whom you will serve. There's that choice again. There's that free will. The people had the choice to serve the Lord, to serve the Lord who they saw all these miracles, who delivered them out of slavery, or they could choose to serve the gods on the other side of the river. And then he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And there's, there it is. Choose for yourselves. And the people cried out with one voice. They said, we will serve the Lord for he is our God. And Joshua warned them and said, you know, God is holy. He's a jealous God. And he's not going to forgive your transgressions or your sins. And the people cried out even louder. We will serve the Lord. And we come to the end of Joshua, the book of Joshua. And we turn the page to the book of Judges. And the book of Judges describes this moral and spiritual decline of the people of Israel. Judges chapter 2 tells us that they abandoned the Lord. In a relatively short period of time, the people descended into a cesspool of sin. Now, we read how it says that, that, that the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. And I think that you can summarize all of the book of Judges in that verse. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, the book of Judges doesn't always tell us specifically in detail what, it, what the evil was that they did. But as you read through it, it gets progressively more and more decadent. We read that they forgot the Lord or they abandoned the Lord. They started to serve other gods, other idols. And each time this happened, God rebuked them, he raised up their enemies who conquered them, and then what happened? The people cry out to God for deliverance, and God raises up a judge who comes and delivers them from their enemies. But the lesson here is that the people did not want to address their sin. They only wanted the consequences of their sin to go away. 
we see a people who decided that they did not want to do things God's way, they wanted to do things their way. And they thought that everything that they were doing was fine until God raised up their enemies. And whether it was forsaking God's word, his law, or worshiping other idols, they were still in their own eyes doing what was right. And they considered themselves religious people. They rationalized away their sin. But their relationship with God, just like we saw in the garden, was shattered. You see, you can be a religious person, but be separated from God. In effect, what they had done was they had written off God. They put God off in a corner and went about their merry way. And it was only God's love for his people that he brought them back. And the cycle of Judges continues for 16 chapters. And again, and things get very worse indeed. Chapter 17, verse 6 says, In those days, which was what our reading was, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Things are about to be, to get unspeakably worse. There was no king in Israel, it says. Why? Because they forsook their king, God. Right? Later on in 1 Samuel, we read how the people came to Samuel and said, we want a king just like everybody else. And Samuel is beside himself. And God reminds him, he says, they're rejecting me. They're rejecting me. If you've ever read anything by Dostoevsky, okay, I get to show how smart I am. He wrote Crime and Punishment and some of those other books. But it, he was quoted as saying, if there's no God, then all things are permissible. If we have no one to answer to, then you can do anything you want. They did what was right in their own eyes. And you'll find that when you're doing things that are right in your own eyes, you are often doing things that are not right in God's eyes. We, as a country, are in similar times. I will often remark how the moral slide of America and the world overall is breathtaking. Have you ever asked yourself, how much lower can we go? How bad can things get? How bad can people be? I mean, right now, for all those that are watching this on live stream and hopefully in, on YouTube, the right to sin is a civil right now. Now, I'm just going to say this. In the Bible, in God's Word, in Genesis 1, right off the bat, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Amen, Amen right? I did a quick Google search. You are free to do that. And I asked the question, how many genders are there? <laughs> well, depending upon the, where, the source and that, there are as many as 74 different classifications of gender now. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, you have to think about that phrase because doing what is right in your own eyes sounds a lot like the freedom to choose. I am free, I can do whatever I please. Doing what is right in your own eyes often means that there are no absolutes. There are no boundaries. What is true for you 
is not true for somebody else. Have you heard that? That's what we call moral relativism. It's only based upon your preferences. Many people today will not, cannot consider absolute truth. That's true for you, but it's not true for me. There's no moral law anymore because you know what? When you're doing things in your own eyes, you're the law. It's like playing a game without any rules. When I was a kid, we loved to play baseball. We had a field that we could play baseball in. Now, if you all know baseball, nine innings, three outs in an inning for each team, and so forth, balls and strikes, you get all that, right? Well, you know, we were sometimes not satisfied with those rules. And so we kind of made up more rules to go along with it. We had things like the designated fourth out. Okay, instead of having three outs, we could, hey, we, we, have, we have a designated fourth out. We're going to continue our, 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 our at bat. But one day we decided that since a baseball game is nine innings long, every, every team gets up at bat nine times. And there's three outs in each inning, every team gets three outs. We said, why don't we just have one at one rotation and each team gets 27 outs? <laughs> right? We well, just get when you get to 27, you're done, and now the other team gets up for 27 outs. <laughs> I know everybody's laughing at that, right? Because if, if you think ahead, you can probably run into, see what some of the problems we ran into. Primarily was we couldn't keep track of how many outs we had. Was that out 17 or 18? That was only 16. No, it was 17. And, and then what ended up happening was the game, the at-bat lasted so long, it started to get dark and we had to go home and do our homework or go home and eat, and the other team didn't get up at bat at all. So it was all kinds of problems, but nevertheless, you can't have a game without rules, right? You can't have an orchestra without the maestro in the front leading it, can you, right? And so the people of Israel were playing without rules. Or at least what they were doing was they were changing the rules as they went. The book of Judges is an account of what it looks like when people want to do things their own way. And as we read in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. That's where we are today. Just, and just like today, just like in America, just like in this country, the people back then, they reaped what they sowed. And that's what we're hap is happening with us. We are now reaping what we have sown over all the years. And I think that this is the reason why Okay, I'm going to go off on a limb. But America is not mentioned in the end times. And you have to ask yourself, why? Consider all that's going on in the world. A person can convince themselves that stealing is, from someone else is okay. You see that happening all the time on the news. Just don't steal from them. Because then all of a sudden that's a problem and that's wrong. I can steal from you but you can't steal from me because that would be wrong. Or consider a husband who ha commits adultery against his wife. He can convince himself that what he's doing is okay. But don't commit adultery with his wife. Then it's wrong. See how people, that's moral relativism. What's true for you is not true for me. The time of the judges answers the question, I can decide what is right for me. Remember this, as we read in scripture, that God is not mocked. He has the final say. And when we claim to be wise, we're fools. So don't be surprised 
when God turns us over or has turned us over to the lust of our hearts. Romans 1. We will find, as someone had said, that the more we do as we please, the less we will be pleased with what we do. Remember this, that the people of Israel at the beginning, they believed in one God. They believed that God had a plan for them. He had a plan for their future. They started out that way. And they degenerated into idolatry and they left behind their belief in God's plan. And they forsook, forsook God and suffered the consequences. So what does all of this mean? What does it mean to say that we have the right to live as we choose? Have you ever wondered what is right? What is wrong? How do you know? How do you know the difference between right and wrong? Kids know it. You ask a child, did you take that cookie? And what is their answer? No. My, yes. <laughs> I, know it was, it's, I know it's true. I know it's true because I did it. I don't know who did that, Ma. I don't know who knocked over the vase. You're the only one in the room. And my brother at the time was probably still in a crib. When Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate asked Jesus a question. He asked him about what his purpose was. Are you a king? Why are you here? And Jesus says this, you know, we often ask ourselves, what, what, why, why did Jesus come? He came to redeem us. He came to take the punishment for our sins. There's a whole host of, of, of reasons why he came. But standing before Pilate, he says, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know the truth. And then Pilate asks this question. I don't know whether or not there was a touch of sarcasm in his voice, or maybe he really wanted to know, but he looks at Jesus and he says, what is truth? Not what is the truth. What is truth? What is truth anyway? Truth is whatever I want it to be. What is truth? And Pilate may not have realized it, and I don't think that he did. He didn't know. But the embodiment of truth was standing right in front of him. Right? When we speak of the characteristics of God, we did that a, a few months ago. All-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere at all times. But God is also all-truth. He knows all things. And so he has to be truthful. He knows everything. Jesus is God incarnate. He came into the world to bear witness to the truth, not a truth, the truth. Pre Jesus had previously told his disciples, he said, I am the way and the truth. I am what truth is. Okay? No one who comes to the Father except through me. The answer that Pilate was looking for was standing right in front of him. You know, we live in a world, I remember taking an astronomy class in college, and we had uh, a planetarium. Have you ever been in a planetarium that shows you the stars and all that, right? That Zeiss projector is what it was, and it shows all the stars and everything like that. And I remember the instructor giving us a test. He wanted us to calculate something. I think it was like the speed of light or something. And he says, you're living on a strange planet. That's hypothetically. And here am I in the classroom. And I, without missing a beat, I said, we sure are. <laughs> and everybody laughed. But it's true, right? I mean, we understand that this is not our home. You know, we're just traveling through. But boy, we live in a world that is confused, right? Doesn't the world look confused to you? 
The world that doesn't want God, the world doesn't want a king, the world doesn't want to submit to authority as much as it looks like they do, but they don't. Romans 1 again tells us that the people would rather exchange the truth of God for a lie. They would rather do that. And when there's no ultimate authority, all things are permissible. When we reject, reject the absoluteness of God's word, and we replace it with what we want, the doors are open for anything. When there are no guiding principles in our lives, we will fall and have fallen into a moral and social and spiritual chaos. How many churches do you see in the area? Have it your way. The world tells us that it's not right for one person. That The world tells us that we cannot say what is right for one person, but not for another. That every person discern, determines what is right for themselves. The world tells us this. But we have the word of God in our hands to guide us and to show us how to live. At the end of the day, and, and I'm so, so thankful for what, what Kelly prayed about this morning, about going forth and, and sharing the gospel. Because you know what? At the end of the day, I hate that phrase. <laughs> Looking for political solutions is not the answer. You know, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't care whether it's Republican or Democrat. I, it, you know, I get it. We try to draw up sides. And honestly, I think it was a great thing that the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. I'm going to just say that right now. But you know what? What has changed? What has changed? As a matter of fact, the battle continues. The darkness has risen up in anger over this. In the state of California, they're debating a law, basically to overturn what the Supreme Court ruled, that's going to make it legal, potentially make it legal, to abort a baby up to 28 days after birth. Four weeks. A four-week-old baby's life could be terminated without cause. They look at the baby and they say, you know what? This baby is going to be a problem for, you know, for us. We didn't catch it at first. Let's end it now. I'm sorry. Just kind of got off on a tangent there. But, you know, but... If you're familiar with World War II and Hitler, there are posters that were put up by the Nazis, specifically targeting those that were infirmed, elderly, sick in some ways, and gay, and said, these people are life unworthy of life. And they're taking away resources from the healthy people. So in, look, read your history. There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So, where does that leave us as we close? Well, you know what? We need a revival in this country and in the world. I am so happy to see the people that were here over these last five weeks, the young folks, they were missionaries. They were missionaries. They were here going to seminary so that they can go and they can plant churches in their countries. You had to meet them. They were phenomenal. It's so encouraging. But revival doesn't begin with the unbeliever. And it sounds counterintuitive. A revival begins with us. The, I think you said it. A fire needs to be struck. All right? 
fighting sin politically is not the answer. Sharing the Jesus who we know is. Calling people out of darkness is what we are called to do. We're called to, we're called to, our, 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 um, our command is to, is to call them out of the darkness that they're living in. And we must ourselves live godly lives that they will see. And let the word of God permeate our lives and rule in us. We must live lives that are contrary to what we see out in the world. And you want to know something? People are going to hate us for it. Be ready. We should let the word of God, it talks about it's a lamp unto my feet. We can share the gospel. As Joe always uses it as, as the, the, the word of life. Right? We share the gospel that brings life. It's the great commission, isn't it? It's the last thing that Jesus told, pretty much the last thing that he told his disciples, right? Go and make disciples. The problem with the book of Judges and the problem with today is that we lack intentional discipleship. And, and, I, and I'm guilty of it myself. I don't blame the politicians or one political party or another. The blame is squarely in the church and in the people inside the church. You thought this was going to be uplifting today, isn't it, didn't you? <laughs> Second Timothy, I heard this this morning. I listened to Tom Short in the morning. He does a weekly, a daily devotional. And he read from 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. When you see what's going on in the world, these people are captured by Satan. Let me tell you something. Don't expect the world to change just because we get another conservative Supreme Court justice on, the, on it. The world will only change when hearts are changed. And until hearts are changed, don't be shocked by the decay around us. Because there's going to be a lot of it. Time is of the essence. We often pray, you know, that we're doing this as we await Jesus' return. Time is of the essence. To do otherwise, to not do this, the book of Judges will be our own legacy. I know. It's not easy to hear. But I spoke to Joe yesterday and we talked a little bit about it, I think today. I have an opportunity to do a mall ministry. To go down to the Freehold Mall and set up a table with tracks and myself and, and, and others and share the gospel with people as they're walking by. As they're walking from Victoria's Secrets to a record store. Do you know Jesus? Time is of the essence. Joe and I also talked about having a, some guest speakers in. I was telling them about my friend Greg. He had... Um, a year ago he contracted COVID pneumonia. He was in the hospital for eight months. His lungs were detaching from his ribcage. They would constantly deflate or whatever that word is. Right? He was on the list for a lung transplant. And people prayed and prayed and prayed for him. He's out of the hospital now without having the transplant. He's on oxygen. For however long he has to be on oxygen, that's up to God. And everything is not perfect. 
physically. But what a testimony. And even a lung transplant would have probably given him seven years, I think he said, five, or five years. But what a story. And while he's in the hospital, people are donating Bibles to him so that he could hand out a Bible to everybody who walked in. I want him to come and share his testimony with you. Let's go forth. Let's, let's have a revival here and share the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so much for allowing us to come before you. We thank you for this beautiful day again as, as we await Jesus' return. And in the meantime, there's a, a, a darkened world out there that needs to hear the message of life, the gospel of truth. To know your love for them and, and the plan that you have for their, for their lives. Uh, a, a, a plan of, of, of spending all of eternity in your presence. And I know that so oftentimes we look at, at, at human and, 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 uh, and, and secular ways of, 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 of solving problems. And in some places that, that works. But we know that the answer to the problems is found in the pages of this book. And the command that you've given us is to go and share it. And that's what we want to do. And we ask for your help, your guidance, your strength, your courage, the boldness that you can impart in us to do those things. We are thankful for all the gifts and, and the talents that you have given each one of us. And you will use those gifts in, in ways to advance your kingdom. And, 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 and I don't know how that's going to look, but I am so looking forward to how you're going to do it. May we be good stewards of all that you've blessed us with. Um, use everything that you've given us for your glory. We thank you again and ask that you would watch over each one of us and those that are watching on, on, on the internet. We ask that you would continue to grow us into the men and women that you want us to be and that we would be bold to share the words of life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.